It is an honor to be here to have a chance to talk to you about this kind of corruption, which I want to distinguish from the typical idea of corruption that most people have in their head. I want to distinguish between what I call good soul corruption and bad soul corruption. So Rob Lagojevich, the Illinois governor convicted of 17 counts of corruption, is what I mean by bad soul corruption. But my view is the problem America faces is not the problem of bad soul corruption. The much more persistent and virulent form of corruption that we must address is this idea of good soul corruption. So let me introduce that idea. August 19th, 1991, a certain kind of hero for me was born. I'm sure many of you remember this image of Boris Yeltsin standing on a tank in front of the Russian parliament fighting back against the right-wing communists who had attempted to reclaim Russia for the communists against the efforts of Gorbachev and eventually Yeltsin to liberate that country. Yeltsin, for me, at that point, became something of a hero because he stood for some important ideals. And at this moment in particular, I had just left a year clerking at the Supreme Court. I was sitting on a beach in Costa Rica reading novels for the whole month, trying once again in my own soul to rediscover ideals. And so when I turned on the television and saw him on this tank, it was for me a moment of inspiration. And this man, this hope for Russia, was an inspiration. But very quickly, as we began to learn of Yeltsin and his particular flaws, a very different image of Yeltsin became dominant in the media. The Yeltsin who couldn't quite control himself, resist the temptations of alcohol. And this idea hit me, this stunning recognition. Here was a man handed the opportunity to change history, the opportunity to save his nation from the authoritarian past. Given this opportunity, still he could not resist this dependency which debilitated him from achieving his objectives. Here was a good soul, deeply committed to the ideals he was pursuing, but corrupted by this dependency he could not resist. Okay, put that side aside for a second, and now I want you to think about trust, or trust and mistrust. So first about trust. There's a series of publications I'm sure many of you have seen called Lonely Planet. These are guidebooks to travel around the world, referred to by many as reliable guidebooks. How do they achieve their reliability? As the publication describes, Lonely Planet books provide independent advice. Lonely Planet do not accept advertising in guidebooks, nor do we accept payment in exchange for listings or endorsing any place or business. Lonely Planet writers do not accept discounts or payments in exchange for positive coverage of any sort. Now, the point there is not that money in this context would mean that the statements made by the reviewers were false. The point is that money in this context would lead us to mistrust the statements made by the reviewers. Or think about Wikipedia. I'm sure many have seen and used Wikipedia. Wikipedia, this online encyclopedia written by the thousands of people who contribute to its craft, does not accept ads. No ads on Wikipedia sites at all. And as it's the fifth largest website in the world, that means every year they leave $100 million in ad revenue on the table. Extraordinary amount of money, which they give up 
Now, as Wikipedia's values are very close to my own and the money would be used for very good purposes in my view, I was eager to ask the founder of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales, why exactly they would choose to leave $100 million a year on the table. And Jimmy said to me, well, the reason is we do care about how the public looks to Wikipedia in all of its glories and all of its flaws, which are numerous, of course. But the one thing they don't say is, quote, well, I don't trust Wikipedia because it's all basically advertising fluff. So again, the point isn't that money would mean what's said here is false. The point is that money may lead us to mistrust what was said. The problem here is not money. The problem here is money in the wrong places. And in these cases, the architects of Lonely Planet and Wikipedia try to keep money in the right place. That's the idea of trust. Think of it how it relates to mistrust. Mistrust as, quote, the act of believing that a particular party has a hidden agenda or ulterior motive. For example, I'm sure many of you recognize this chemical, Bisphenol A, otherwise known as BPA, this is a chemical that is increasingly spread throughout our environment in things like, well, in particular in this bottle, has BPA on it, and in many of the soft plastics which you expose yourself to. And more than 87% of you have EPA, BPA in your body at a level that is concerning to scientists for its consequences on your health, and more concern is the consequences on the health of young children. So this question of the safety of BPA is quite pronounced in scientific circles, but most of us are convinced that it must be safe. How could it be that a chemical that 86% of us are exposed to at such significant levels isn't unsafe? Don't we have government regulators to guarantee safety like this? But in fact, the research here is contested and it's contested in a particularly distinctive way. If you divide the studies between industry-funded studies and independently funded studies, and then separate out studies that find harm from studies that find no harm, the pattern here will concern even those most convinced that this chemical must be safe. Overwhelmingly, industry-funded studies find no harm, and independently funded studies find harm. And whatever you thought about BPA before, now you are less sure than you were before. Or think of another example, cell phones. Are cell phones safe? These microwave emitting devices that we put right next to our brain. Do they produce effects on the brain? In particular, do they induce cancer on the brain? Now, 70% of us are sure can't have any possible harm from cell phones. We've had 50 years of experience with cell phones. It must be the case that our regulators have kept us safe from a dangerous object like this, if indeed it is dangerous. But again, the research here is contested, and contested in a way that will give no comfort to any of us who are concerned, especially as we watch our 10-year-old children pick up cell phones and spend hours and hours playing with them and speaking on them. Again, the research is distinct in the pattern of findings. Independently funded research finds systematic trouble with cell phone radiation against, um, uh, uh, against the head, and industry-funded studies don't. Whatever you thought before, now you are less sure. Now again, the point is we have a certain confidence which gets affected by the way in which money is related to the judgments that are made and that relationship undermining our confidence is extraordinarily important to map and to track if we are to preserve confidence in the institutions we depend upon. Now this is an issue which the Supreme Court has thought about a lot as it thinks about how to preserve confidence in the courts. So in a recent case decided um, by Justice, written by Justice Souter in 2008, Exxon Shipping versus Baker. The question in the case was whether the Constitution should limit the ability 
of juries to give punitive damages in the context of admiralty cases. And there was a bunch of studies that were conducted to demonstrate the irrationality of juries in the context of punitive damage in um, cases like this. So the court eventually concluded that the Constitution did restrict the ability of juries to give punitive damages. But in the course of issuing its opinion, the court dropped this footnote. It said, the court is aware of a body of literature running parallel to anecdotal reports examining the predictability of punitive awards by conducting numerous mock juries where different jurors are confronted with the same hypothetical case. But then the court went on, because this research was funded in part by Exxon, one of the parties in the case, we decline to rely upon it. So the principle here is, because it was funded in part by an interested party, the court will not have anything to do with it. Now the question addressed by this research was important and substantial. And I know many of the researchers personally, and my own view is that there's zero chance that they were affected by the funding that they received by Exxon to distort their results. So why is it that relying on the briefs funded in part by Exxon is okay for the Supreme Court, and relying upon the argument made by the lawyers in the case funded in part by Exxon was okay, but it's not okay to rely upon the research funded in part by Exxon? Well, the answer is that the court has a certain fear and the fear is that well, it will create a world of researchers who have a kind of improper dependence. A dependence upon the very party whose behavior the researcher is trying to evaluate. And therefore, to avoid that dependence, a whole class of speech, a whole class of researcher gets disqualified by the court. Whether trustworthy, or not. The Supreme Court says we will not consider research funded in this way so as to avoid even the appearance that the research has been compromised by its funding. Now many people looked at what the Supreme Court did and thought it was admirable, but when you think about what government does in general, you might say it's a little bit precious too. Because when you compare what the court did to protect the integrity of the judicial process with what happens in the administrative process generally, it's hard to see how the two connect. So think, for example, about the history of environmental lead and the regulation of environmental lead. In 1972, the EPA gave its first notice that it was going to begin to push lead out of gasoline. And in 1976, we began the end of the sale of lead in gasoline, and by 1995, all lead was gone from gasoline. And the consequences on our environment and on the health of people within our environment was quite profound. There was an 80% drop in substantial lead rates in children after that change, and a substantial increase in the IQ of our children attributed in part to the change in the environmental lead that they were exposed to. Now that dramatic change led many people to say, why did we do this sooner? And that question is quite profound because it was no secret that lead was a serious environmental harm and danger. In 1921, the president of the National Lead Company admitted that lead was an environmental danger that needed to be regulated. Nonetheless, after 1921, lead was added to gasoline as a way to improve the efficiency of gasoline. American Petroleum Institute in 1965 said, all accepted medical evidence proves conclusively that lead in the environment presents no threat to public health. In 1984, they said lead had been used in gasoline for 60 years and there is no evidence that anyone has ever been harmed. Now, of course, those claims were not true, but the research here that led to those conclusions was research that was funded in part by the parties directly affected by the regulation. And that research led to a delay caused by studies funded in part by the industry that was interested in the regulation. 
Or think about the history of regulation of a chemical called chromium-6, or hexavalent chromium oxide. This is a chemical that was used in contexts where there was um, metal work being done that required a certain kind of bonding agent. And in those shops, there was a certain trick that old workers would perform with young workers called the dime trick. What the dime trick was is that an old worker would take a dime and pass it from one side of his nose to the other through the hole in the septum that had developed because of his exposure to this chemical, chromium-6. Now that led some people to think maybe there's something dangerous in this chemical. <laughs> and eventually the government got around to looking at it. In 1976, OSHA said that it concluded that a comprehensive occupational health standard is urgently needed to protect employees. And they promised to, quote, complete it in the shortest possible time. That was 1976. The regulation of chromium-6 was issued in the shortest possible time in 2006, 30 years later. And that delay for 30 years was caused by a series of studies that were funded in part by the industries that were to be regulated by these regulations, causing the government to slow down its process of concluding, as it eventually concluded, that this indeed was a dangerous chemical. Now the point is in both cases, indeed in all cases in the context of what the regulatory agencies do, regulatory proceedings are driven by data that is funded in part by the industries regulated. And in many contexts, this leads to decades of delay in the agencies coming to a final conclusion about the need for regulation, and in some contexts leading to literally thousands of additional deaths caused by that delay. Or think, for example, in the context of vaccines. Now, I want to be very careful here. Vaccines, in my view, are good and right and needed. And I'm not cause saying that mercury causes autism. Let's just make this perfectly clear. Vaccines are good, and mercury does not cause autism. Right? I'm not making those claims here at all. But what I want you to focus on is the extraordinary rise in the number of parents who refuse to vaccinate their children against very deadly childhood diseases. And that rise, I want to suggest, is a consequence, or has the consequence, of the return of these very deadly diseases. The doctors tell parents that these drugs are safe, but the parents increasingly ignore the doctors. Why is that? Well, as the New York Times reported in 2009, there is a huge trust gap between parents and public health officials right now. And what leads to that trust gap? In my view, what leads to it is in part that these claims of safety are made in a context, science, and the context has a certain character it is increasingly affected by money. So think, for example, about this drug, this drug called Activase, um, which is said here to be a drug you should use to reperfuse with. I was a little puzzled by that as well, but I was reinforced in my puzzlement by the fact that the Oxford English Dictionary doesn't actually have reperfuse as a word. There's reperfusion, but there's no verb form of reperfusion here. But anyway, if you're going to reperfuse, you should use this drug, apparently. This drug is designed to deal with strokes. Um, what we called strokes is now called brain attacks. Um, and the drug was studied for many years, um, and in 1998, the American Heart Association released a study that was basically concluding that it was a safe drug. There was a support for the drug, but there was also a dissent. But in 2000, when that report was finally published, the dissent was erased, removed from the final report. And the only report included the report of support by the doctors who thought the drug was supported. And then it was discovered that Genentech had given the American Heart Association $11 million in contributions about the same time that the dissent was dropped from the report, leading to obvious questions. As the journalist Lenzer reported, this recommendation may have been made in the true spirit of unbiased scientific inquiry, 
but the appearance of dispassionate analysis was eroded by large donations from a drug company. So again, the point is the context produces doubts. The perceived conflicts produces doubts in people's minds about the truth of what's being said. And indeed, in uh, the early part of uh, this century, in 2001, the challenge of conflicts in the context of the FDA was quite pronounced, as one report put it from uh, Congress. The FDA standards defining conflicts of interest are ridiculously broad. The CDC has virtually no standards because all committee members receive automatically annual waivers from conflicts of interest. So you can sit on these panels reviewing drugs and receive money from the drug companies whose drugs you are receiving. And in one case, a doctor had received more than a quarter of a million dollars from a drug company in the context in which he was reviewing drugs by that drug company. So again, the point is, the context produces doubts, and then the doubts feed a literally deadly meme in our culture. I'm going to give you a little snippet of that meme. Um, but the science is clear, and what happens is, I read the science at first, and there's literally hundreds and hundreds of studies that connect thimerosal to, you know, to these disastrous neurological disorders. Then I went, I talked to the scientists, then I went and I talked to the federal bureaucrats who are defending thimerosal, and I said, what are you relying on? And I looked at the science they're relying on, and I can tell you, Joe, it is so weak. And you and I have seen, you know, legal practice with junk science, and we know, you know, what these phony scientists are who create this stuff. It happens stuff. in big tobacco. Right. Tobacco. It happens in and big this oil. Is, and this it's is, happening in global warming. And, and now it's happening in a way that's impacting this is, our kids' lives. This is classic tobacco science. Okay, now, classic tobacco science. Now, with all respect to Mr. Kennedy, his claims about hundreds of studies linking thimerosal and autism is just not true. There are no hundreds of studies making that link. The one major study was eventually disproven after it was discovered that the scientists had fabricated the data. So there is no link between thimerosal and autism. But the point is that the funding of this research makes it trivially easy for people like Robert Kennedy and Joe Scarborough, Republican and Democrat together, to point to the research and say it must be flawed because it's classic tobacco science, meaning the science is being driven by researchers who have an interest in the results, leading all of us to wonder whether that interest has corrupted the science and that corruption weakens the trust we might have in the judgments and the recommendations of these scientists. So is it any wonder that a system that can't figure out that lead and chromium-6 is dangerous for, in the chromium-6 context, 30 years, is there any doubt that people who can't understand why giving $250,000 to a committee member reviewing drugs from the company who has paid that amount of money breeds mistrust? Is there any doubt that it would breed such mistrust? And is there any wonder that in the face of that mistrust, parents would choose to not vaccinate their children, despite the extraordinary harm that choice produces. The consequences of this mistrust is an enormous threat to the health of our children produced by the way in which we choose to fund the research that produces the science that guides us about health for our children. Okay, so my point here <laughs> is that you have a recognition a recognition that I'm sure all of you have had many, many times. A recognition about the way that money poisons trust. Not money in general, but money in some places poisons the possibility of trust. Because when money is in that place, we begin to believe that the decisions or the actions or the will of those who are to make the judgments that we are to rely upon is being guided by something it should not be guided by. It is not being decided 
by reason, it's being decided by something improper, it's being decided or influenced by an improper dependence upon this money. And this improper dependence then erodes the trust we have in the institution we must rely upon. Okay, now I want you to take the first story and the second. First story about Yeltsin, and the second story is about how we understand trust and put them together. And recognize that when we talk about corruption, most of the time we're thinking about an individual and about individual corruption. But just as important, indeed in my view, much more important than individual corruption is what we could call institutional corruption. Institutional corruption here, we should understand in a very precise way, and I'm going to start by defining what it is by explaining what it is not. By institutional corruption, I don't mean Rob Lagojevich. I don't mean bribery. I don't mean any violation of existing rules. By institutional corruption, I don't mean illegal corruption. Instead, by institutional corruption, I mean legal corruption. I mean, instead, a certain kind of influence within what we could think of as an economy of influence that has a certain effect. It is institutional corruption if it does one of two things. If it weakens the effectiveness of an institution, especially by weakening public trust of that institution. If it does one of those two things, then it is what I will define here as institutional corruption. So let's have an example, what I think of as the paradigm case of institutional corruption, institution you might have heard of, the United States Congress. And I would commend to you this extraordinary book by Robert Kaiser of the Washington Post, So Damn Much Money, which is an account of how this institution has changed dramatically over the time since the middle 1990s. And the change is driven by a change in lobbying and the way in which lobbying has its effect inside of Washington. So as Kaiser describes, we can think of Washington now as having its own economy. The economy has, at its core, lobbyists, and lobbyists then benefit members of our Congress, and the members benefit special interests, and then the special interests benefit the lobbyists. Right? Each of these pays the other, each of them depends upon the other. So think first about the way special interests pay lobbyists. This is the most obvious example. As Kaiser writes, in earlier generations, enterprising young men came to Washington looking for power and political adventure, often with ambitions to save or reform the country or the world. But in the last fourth of the 20th century, such aspirations were supplanted by another familiar American yearning, the yearning to get rich. So as he describes, this industry, the lobbying industry, is about a $9 to $12 billion industry, and it has produced enormous wealth to the leaders of this industry. So Gerald Cassidy, the founder of the modern Earmark, has amassed more than $100 million in personal wealth because of his relation to this industry, because it turns out the business of selling policy in America is an extremely lucrative business. And then the lobbyists pay the members. They pay the members both during their time in Congress and after their time in Congress. During their time, lobbyists pay members with cash, but I don't mean the cash secreted in brown paper bags. Again, I'm not talking about bribery or any other criminal act. I would stipulate with my colleague Dennis Thompson that this Congress is among the cleanest Congresses in the history of Congress if we're talking about bribery and other criminal acts. Instead, the kind of cash that gets paid to this con this, these members of Congress is support for their campaigns. As the cost of campaigns has gone through the roof, members become increasingly dependent upon those who would fund their campaigns. Members who spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money 
to get back into Congress or to get their Congress, their party, back into power, these members increasingly look to lobbyists as suppliers. And to push the metaphor just a bit, lobbyists as pushers in this economy of influence. Now this, Kaiser said, is new. As he quotes, money has been part of American politics forever, on occasion in the Gilded Age or the Harding administration, for example, much more blatantly than recently. But the scale of it has just gotten way out of hand. The money may have come in brown paper bags in earlier eras, but the politicians needed and took much less of it than they take through more formal channels today. So, for example, compare this man, Senator Max Baucus, a man who represents 0.3% of the American population. When he was chair of a committee that was essentially overseeing the health care reform, he openly and proudly took more than $4 million in contributions from the very industries he would be regulating and crafting the health care bill that eventually got passed. Compare Max Baucus, Democrat, um, with this man, Senator John Stennis of Mississippi. Now, Stennis was no choir boy. He got to Congress not by being the most virtuous man in the history of Congress, but when he was chairman of the Armed Services Committee in the early 1980s, a, Congress, a colleague suggested to him that they hold a fundraiser for defense contractors. And Stennis said, would that be proper? He said, I hold life and death over these companies. I don't think it would be proper for me to take money from them. Now the point that Kaiser makes is that that ethic reflected in John Stennis, again, no choir boy, that ethic is not even recognizable in Washington today. No one would hesitate to take money from the people you hold life and death over. Indeed, that's the best way to get money from people, to hold life and death over them. And increasingly, we see that leverage being leveraged to produce the money Washington needs to run their campaigns. So that's how the lobbyists pay during the life of a member in Congress, but they also pay after. So lobbyists pay members with a future. As my friend Jim Cooper, a congressman from Tennessee, who's been in Congress for uh, essentially for more than 30 years, says, Capitol Hill has increasingly become a kind of farm league for K Street. Members and staffers and bureaucrats have an increasingly common business model in their head, a business model that's focused on their life after government, their life as lobbyists. So as one study concluded, between 1998 and 2004, 50% of senators and 42% of members of, con of the House left Congress to become lobbyists, showing how everybody depends upon the current system surviving so that they have the extraordinary opportunity for income after they leave their jobs as members of Congress. Indeed, these people are very much like my students. My students from the Harvard Law School graduate from the Harvard Law School, and the best of them go to work at firms, for example, in Wall Street, and they make about $180,000 in their first year. That's what a member of Congress makes. But then these students hope that after six or eight years, they will graduate from making the paltry sum of $180,000 to becoming a partner, make a half a million or a million dollars a year. That's what members of Congress want to do as well. They want to leave their associate position and become partners, but the partnership is not in Congress, the partnership is on K Street. When they become lobbyists on K Street and get paid an enormous amount of money because the system leverages their influence into changes in public policy. And that's how lobbyists pay members after their time in Congress. So both during and after, lobbyists are paying members, and then the members pay the special interests through policies that get changed, sometimes extraordinarily profitably. So this paper from the University of Kansas estimating the return on investment from lobbying dollars spent to get this statute, the American Jobs Creation Act, modified. The return on investment for the lobbyist dollars spent was 22,000%. Or in this paper published in 2009, 
the uh, research we were able to show that for every dollar spent by large corporations to try to get targeted tax benefits, for every lobbying dollar they spent, they could lower their taxes by between six and twenty dollars in lower taxes. Again, a very good return anywhere, and especially in Washington. So they do it profitably, and sometimes they do it brazenly. Last year, this, this article was published in the New York Times um, about Senator Schumer going to Wall Street to try to get Wall Street to uh, reward the Democratic Party with more contributions for the next election cycle. And the paper reports how, quote, city titans of finance at a recent closed-door meeting accused him, Schumer, of being insufficiently pro-Wall Street, one indignant fellow stood up and demanded his donation back. Now, this is Senator Charles Schumer. There is no senator in the United States Senate who has bent over backwards more to please Wall Street, yet even this man is not enough for this contributor, and his contributor wants his donations back. Okay, so these influences and changes happen, yet the politicians insist there is no improper influence here. They deny it. I was told by one member of Congress, it's ridiculous to think the money is affecting the results. As he told me, maybe it affects access. And as former Congressman Mazzoli puts it, people who get contribute get the ear of the member and the ear of the staff. They have access, and access is it. Access is power. But as I was lectured, it doesn't change results. But I find this pretty hard to believe. At least if you want to be charitable in interpreting what Congress does. Right? Because there's a whole suite of these easy cases, the kind of two plus two equals four cases, which our government just gets wrong. Right? So for example, I spent many years of my life fighting in the context of reforms around intellectual property, in, fact, in particular copyright. I became a reformer on October 27, 1998. When Congress passed and the President signed a statute in honor of this great American, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. Now what the Copyright Term Extension Act did was extend the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. Existing copyrights, future copyrights as well, but the part we challenged was the existing copyrights. And the question Congress was to ask when they passed this statute was, does such a change advance the public good? Does giving existing copyright owners 20 more years of monopoly control over their copyrighted work advance the public good? Now, the way copyright is supposed to work is to create incentives for people to create great work. We promise a monopoly in exchange for great work being produced. But the thing about incentives is that incentives are prospective. Not even the United States Congress can get George Gershwin to produce anything more. <laughs> so it couldn't possibly make sense, from the perspective of incentives, to increase the term for an existing copyright. Maybe future copyrights, but existing copyrights, it could make no sense. And so, indeed, when we challenged the statute in the Supreme Court, a bunch of economists, six Nobel Prize winning economists, including this liberal economist, oh wait, that's Milton Friedman, right-wing Nobel Prize winning economist. We asked him to join the brief to challenge this extension of copyright, and Milton Friedman said he would only sign the brief if the word no-brainer was somewhere in the brief. <laughs> so obvious was it that you couldn't advance the public good by extending the term of existing copyright. But apparently there were no brains in this place when Congress unanimously passed this statute. What there was in this place was more than $6 million in contributions by the Disney Corporation and others who would benefit from that extension. Here is an easy public policy question the Congress just gets wrong. Or think, for example, about this tragic picture of a 14-year-old boy a picture of an epidemic, as the Center for American Progress puts it, the epidemic of childhood obesity. Since 1980, the number of obese children have tripled in the United States. Now, for children over two, one-third are technically obese. Now, this epidemic has important costs. One quite surprising cost the rise is the rise of type 2 diabetes. Right? Type 2 diabetes is the sort of di diabetes that older people typically get. 
But in some communities now, half of the new cases are cases with kids. Total annual direct care costs are estimated by the Center for American Progress to be $147 billion to our economy every year. So why is it we've produced this nation of increasingly obese children? Well, obviously it relates to what we eat. There's a consensus among people who study this that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff, and actually not precisely sugar. Consensus is we're eating increasingly too much of this stuff, high fructose corn syrup, a compound which 30 years ago no human had ever consumed. Now 40% of the products in your supermarket have high fructose corn syrup in it. Why is that? Well, the answer is that sugar is expensive relative to corn. And that leads some people to say, well, that's what the market demands. The market allocates resources to the highest valued user, and this is just the best allocation of these resources. But it's not quite so simple. Sugar is extremely expensive in America because we have tariffs that protect domestic manufacturers against foreign competitors. The tariffs give the domestic manufacturers about a billion dollars in extra revenue every year and cost the economy about three billion dollars in efficiency because sugar is two to three times the cost in the United States as it is in Canada and other countries around the world. And corn is so cheap in the United States because it is subsidized. So more than $74 billion in subsidies over the last 15 years, leading some economists to say the cost of growing corn is actually negative. So you take these two factors together, tariffs and subsidies, and you can understand the radical shift in the cost of foods. So between 1997 and 2003, the cost of vegetables went up by 17%. Cost of a Big Mac went down by 5.4%. The cost of a bottle of Coke went down by 35%. And you can understand a radical shift in how food gets made. So I'm sure some of you saw this fantastic film, Food, Inc., which tells a story about how, because corn is so cheap now, it's profitable to feed corn to cattle rather than have cattle graze on grass. That makes factory farms profitable to feed corn to the cattle, not so profitable for the poor cows, because of course, cows' stomachs don't actually digest corn properly. The corn just sits in the seven different sacks and stews instead of being properly flushed through the system, leading to an extraordinary growth in bacteria requiring literally tons of antibiotics to be spread through their food so that the antibiotics can kill the bacteria that is being produced by the corn that they are consuming. And as all of you recognize, if you spew a bunch of antibiotics into a, anti into a bacterial environment, what you do is you begin to filter out the weaker versions of the bacteria and preserve the stronger, more virulent versions of the bacteria, meaning we now have plentiful supply of bacteria that is resistant to the antibiotics that we typically use to kill off dangerous bacteria. And if this were a film, we'd now cut to a scene where a four-year-old boy eats a hamburger and dies because of the poisoning caused by precisely this kind of infection. All of this because corn is so cheap and sugar is so dear. Now the free market types should look at this and say, what explains such anti-free market silliness in our national food policy? And there are many possible explanations, but here's the one thing we know for sure. An endless supply of campaign cash driving to these silly results. So ADM has spent literally millions to induce the subsidy of corn. Washington Post reports about millions being given by Florida sugar companies to support the tariffs on sugar. And so we can say, if it's because of this money, we can say campaign contributions are distorting the market, which is distorting food production, which eventually distorts our children. Or here's another example. Think about Wall Street. We've just gone through the greatest catastrophe in our economy since the Great Depression. What led to that catastrophe? Well, I'd recommend this great book by Simon Johnson and James Quack, 13 Bankers, where they describe this kind of perverse mix 
in our economy, a perverse mix of too little government and too much government. Too little government in the form of deregulation. So in the 1990s, we saw an explosion of financial innovations. But because these innovations, derivatives, were not regulated by the government, they were essentially invisible to the market. So people didn't know the extent or the value of these derivatives because they were not traded in open public markets. So my colleague Frank Parknoy estimated that in 1980, 98% of the financial assets traded in our economy were traded in open public regulated markets so that people knew the price, knew anti-fraud requirements attached to all of those assets. But by 2008, 90% of the assets traded in our economy were traded over the counter, meaning not subject to these anti-fraud transparency requirements, producing the shadow banking industry, which encouraged the production of the bubble, which eventually exploded and brought down the economy with it. But the claim of Quack and Johnson is that that alone is not enough to explain what happened. In addition to too little government, there was too much government, because through the 1990s, the government sent a very clear beacon to the financial services sector in the form of a kind of guarantee. And the guarantee was that when this bubble burst, there would be a bailout on the other side, producing, as Paul Krugman describes, socialized risk and privatized benefits. We bear the risk of their gambles. When they go south, we pay for it. They get the benefit of the gambles. When they pay off, they get the enormous bonuses which get produced. The dumbest form of socialism ever invented by man. Technically, we would describe this in legal, cir legal circles as an insanely stupid way to regulate an economy. So what is it that led us to this stupidity? Well, again, lots of possible causes, but one thing we know for sure, the fastest growth in campaign contributions of any sector in our economy between 1990 and 2010 came from the financial services sector. Or one final example. I'm sure many of you, when you looked at the extraordinary catastrophe of the Deepwater Horizon, wondered, how is it that such an experimental drilling platform would be permitted without extensive environmental impact and risk studies being conducted. I mean, for example, in my part of the country, we've just spent nine years and 10,000 pages of EPA reports to conclude that we're allowed to build something like this clean energy system for producing energy um, off the Cape. So how much study was there before the experimental deep water drilling of the deep water horizon was allowed? And the answer is there was 17 pages before the project was exempted from any further EPA review. Now, of course, when Congress heard this, Congress was shocked. I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Everybody out at once. Yet, of course, it was Congress that had required this ridiculous system of 30-day approval for these applications. And you ask, why would Congress require such craziness? And the many possible answers are there. But again, the one thing we know for sure is the endless campaign cash that drove to these crazy pro-oil results. Now, in all of these cases, Congress's decisions are made in the way that they're made either because Congress is a bunch of idiots or because Congress is being guided by something other than reason here. And my own view, I know this is controversial, but my own view is Congress is not a bunch of idiots. These are hardworking, good souls trying to do what they believe is right, but trying to do it in a system that can't help but distort them from a focus on what is right. In each of these cases, all that I had to do was to point the money, point my finger at the money for you, and your trust in the results here collapses. You believe, you believe you know that it's the money that's driving the result, despite the fact that there are good souls here. These good souls, you still believe, have been corrupted and policy-bent. You believe policy-bent 
to those who pay in this economy of influence where members benefit special interests. So this economy where special interests benefit lobbyists, benefit members, produces this kind of marionette Congress, in our view, leading most of us, 75% of us, to believe money buys results in Congress. This is institutional corruption of this institution. This is what Washington has become, as was described to me by the chief lobbyist for one of the largest uh, oil companies in the city. And the question we have to ask is, can democracy survive it? Okay, that's the question, but it's intermission time, folks. <laughs> I, uh, every now and then I'm tempted to say that's the best presentation I've seen. There's no question. 